All right. I'd like to call tonight's regular meeting of council to order. Recommendation that the agenda for the regular council meeting of October 5th, 2020 be adopted as presented with the addition of late item 4G, Principal Fire Rescue, re regarding a proclamation request. Late item 4H, Rewardery Club of Prince Rupert, regarding proclamation requests. And late item 4I, um, regarding uh, BC Child Care Spaces Fund application. Moved by Councillor Niche, second by Councillor Skelton Morvan. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. I'll also mention that Councillor Moreau is with us on the phone tonight. Uh, 3A, recommendation that the minutes of the special council meeting of September 14th, 2020 be adopted. Moved by Councillor 80, seconded by Councillor Randhawa. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Item 3B, recommendation the minutes of the regular council meeting of September 14, 2020 be adopted. Moved by Councillor Niche, seconded by Councillor Scott Morvan. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Okay, uh, item 4A, application for development, development variance permit. Uh, recommendation that Mayor and Council approve the development variance permit number DP 2019 for 1819 Atlam Avenue to proceed to public notification. Moved by Councillor Scott Morvin, second by Councillor Nish. Any uh, comments from staff regarding this project? Any questions from Council? I'll just make a quick comment. So you'll note in the application that the applicant's information has been removed, and this is different than in the past, and that's in accordance with the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. So going forward, all applicant information will be removed. In addition, the sketch that's shown, um, the sketch is just a sketch, it's not exact measurements. The applicant has amended their drawing to ensure that the stairs don't fall on city property. So the, the measurements are correct, but the sketch is, has been adjusted and is, he, the applicant is working with the building department to ensure that full compliance. Okay, any comments? Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Next, we have a report from our Chief Financial Officer regarding the Argus 2020 Budget Variance Report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. In general, revenues and expenses in the operating and utility funds continue to perform as expected. All services as at the end of August were transitioning back to usual levels with modification in light of maximum occupancy during the pandemic. Since April, we have been communicating that we wanted to see how affected city departments such as recreation, Airport Ferry, the Marina, and Transit were performing after reducing expenses where possible to offset revenue losses in these departments. We have forecast to the end of the year now and expect that the efforts made have been able to make up for the revenues lost and we will still end the year close to a balanced budget. For these reasons, we are not recommending any amendment to these departments in our upcoming five-year financial plan amendment bylaw. To carry on, August was a near record breaking month with respect to rainfall. Therefore, capital projects were inter interrupted and delayed. Staff is assessing which may be rolled over into 2021. Those that are continuing are still within budget. And that concludes my report for August. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Any questions from Council? Okay. Next, we have a report from our Chief Financial Officer regarding the external auditor appointment. Thank you. The city routinely puts out requests for proposals for ongoing services such as banking and insurance. Uh, staff assessed that it was time to obtain proposals for external auditing services for the city's annual audit. A request for proposals was placed on BC Bid at the end of June for services covering fiscal year ends 2020 through 2022. Of the five compliant proposals, the evaluation team is recommending Carlisle Shepherd and Company. The firm is the only local firm to submit a proposal, and although two other proposals were slightly less in price, the difference was not enough to warrant recommending moving the service to a non-local firm. Council is asked to approve the recommendation and appoint Carlisle Shepherd and Company the external auditor for the fiscal year ends 2020 through 2022. Okay, recommendation that council approve the recommendation of the chief financial officer and appoint Carla and Shepard Co. the external auditor for the fiscal year ending 2020 through 2022. Moved by Councillor Scott Morvin, second by Councillor Nish. Discussion. Just for clarification. Um, yeah, Councillor 81st, and then after you there, Councillor Morrow. Uh, just for clarification, there, there are, I suppose they might be considered relatively small differences in terms of the total amount. Um, 
and that the Carlisle Shepherd um, proposal is, is the highest number and could you indicate how that's going to be compensated for if it can be the report to council identifies that the other two uh, firms who had bid that were lower in price there was the possibility of having additional travel costs incorporated into each of their uh, audit years outside of the first year and when you factored that in it actually brought them closer in line with Carlisle Shepherd and Company and that's why we uh, after factoring that possibility in we uh, made the recommendation that Carlisle should be the one that continues the engagement um, or has appointed to this engagement rather uh, they have been our incumbent firm uh, for a number of years so there's also a, a lot of staff time that is uh, required to detail internal control processes systems all sorts of things with respect to the internal workings of, of, and of the finance department um, and how all of the operations work at this at this city uh, every firm that had uh, submitted a proposal they're all qualified so it really came down to um, what was the the last little bits and it really was price and so that was a uh, uh, heavy weighting uh, it was in the criteria as well each of the firms knew it and um, Carlos Shepard after the the proposals factoring in the possibility of additional travel costs because the other two firms are actually out of Prince George uh, it it turned out that it would made more sense for uh, the price to go ahead and, and give it to or recommend it rather to Carlisle Shepherd and Company. Okay, thank you. Councilor Morrow. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think this, it, this question comes up to me and it's actually kind of ironic that it's based on an audit contract. I'm, I'm wondering if the city has any uh, financial policies in place or audit controls in place for when these RFPs are released, if we have um, standardized time frames for RFPs that are relatively small in nature, I think in this case being under that 100,000 threshold. Um, I'm not certain I quite understand the question, Council Moreau, but I'll take a stab at it. Um, we don't. Sorry, I, I can rephrase if it's helpful. Sure. Uh, for as long as I've been here, um, the contract for external auditing services has not gone out for tender. Um, we have done banking, we've done insurance, but not not the auditing one. Um, so that's one of the reasons that we said it was time. We actually wanted to do it last year, but we didn't get to it. So so this year we made a point of making sure that we could we could do it. Um, there is nothing that says specifically in our financial policies but how long we should have the contract for. Uh, our RFP actually says three years with the possibility of an extension for a further two. Um, and then if so if uh, it's recommended to council to reappoint for the next two years it would actually be a five year uh, engagement before we go back out for um, a, a request for proposals. Thank you uh, for the question and thank you for acknowledging that it is uh, um, definitely a worthwhile policy and we are actually trying to move towards that. That's one of the reasons that we left it with just a three-year um, appointment with the possibility of extending for two so that we can actually keep going back out into the market to make sure that we're getting good value for service. Councillor Renhawa. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So 
like uh, when we ask for uh, like a proposal right so do we reach to the firms or we just put our in bbc bid and they reach to us how how it this works that's exactly how it works it goes on bc bid and then interested firms go ahead and um uh, submit a proposal um it says in the proposal that we ask for audit firms to have experience with municipal auditing. So perhaps that is one of the reasons, I, I'm not sure, I can't speak to the other auditing firms in town, whether or not they have other municipal experience in other locations, uh, but we didn't receive anybody else. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, so kind of, we have a motion on the floor? Okay. Okay, so all those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Okay, next we have a report from our Director of Operations regarding the construction services for Landfill Cell Expansion Project. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you. So the recommendation from uh, the Director of Operations and the Department staff is to award the construction services for Landfill Cell Expansion Project to CT Northern Contractors Alliance. So as, uh, as Council and the community is aware, uh, we have been operating our, on our existing landfill for a number of years. This uh, area is now completely or almost completely exhausted. We have to develop a new cell. Uh, and where that cell is going is in our quarry. So we are looking to remove a, a, a bunch of rock out of our quarry to make the cell and, uh, and then have that then additionally later on lined and, and uh, prepped for a refuse deposit. Uh, so on uh, September 22nd, we had uh, six different compliant proposals come through the door here for RFP 2007. Uh, they were proposals, they, they weren't uh, tender prices. So each one uh, that came through the door had uh, different options associated with it. The city took the uh, two lowest bids that were compliant uh, because some of them were um, uh, sort of hung against if they were able to receive contracts uh, so they they weren't guaranteed to to go forward so we took the two that were guaranteed and the lowest and we worked with both of them to try and get the best price for the city and uh, in the end we uh, landed on CT Northern Contractors Alliance for six million four hundred nineteen thousand seven hundred nineteen dollars and we are looking to award to them today they are able to start uh, immediately and finish hopefully early and and we would like to move forward. Uh, also, uh, talking with our finance department, the proposal is acceptable within the capital works budget for landfill expansion for 2020. Thank Great. you. Recommendation that mayor and council approve the recommendation of the director of operations and operations department staff and award the construction services for landfill cell expansion project to CT Northern Construction Alliance. Moved by Councillor Scott Marvin, second by Councillor Nish. Discussion? Councillor Randawa. So, you want to like uh, if they will hire local people for construction or? Co correct. Uh, CT, uh, uh, CTNCA is, is, is their, their acronym. They are a local company. They were formed in 2014 in Prince Rupert. They are uh, between uh, IDL and the Ko Shimshan, and they have uh, several employees in town, and they are currently working on uh, port projects and other projects on Ridley. They have uh, machinery in town, and they are a large local employer in our community. So which was the other bid that was competitive with this? Was it another local company or? Correct, it was another local company. It was Adventure Paving that we were working with both of them as they were both compliant and they were the two lowest. Uh, and in the end, the CTNCA was the lowest overall for guaranteed um, to move forward with options that we could uh, have additional savings uh, opportunities. I have a question, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so this, this is a local moment. company? Correct, it is a local company, yes. Okay. Go ahead, Councilor Morrow. Sorry if I interrupt you, Councilor Cunningham. Uh, just in your report there, uh, Mr. Gucci, in the analysis, you make a comment just at the end that um, there's this opportunity for savings if material sales increase. Um, are, is that in reference 
to the rock that's going to be blasted out, the, the material saving? Correct. So uh, if, if the material makes spec on uh, other projects that could be happening in, in the north, uh, they would we would see additional credit savings after that if they're able to sell it for a higher price than initially quoted. So they will keep in contact with us and try to sell our rock and then we would get more royalty on that rock after. So I, I apologize if I'm, I'm putting you on the spot, but would you be able to give us a rough um, not even necessarily an estimate, but even just the range of, of how much of that rock potentially could be sold at market? There is a surplus of 152,000 cubic meters of uh, blasted rock. Uh, the, uh, the potential uh, upsale on that is a, an additional $880,000 above this uh, this base price and this base price was already at um, the the best value for the city of Prince Rupert or the let's call it the lowest bid with another opportunity for for more savings if the rock meets certain specifications and can be used in northern projects. Awesome. Okay, thanks very much. I, I appreciate that. And, and just my final note, not not a question, just a comment. Uh, I really appreciate the hard work that you've put into this file. You always make our job easy when you come in with the. Lowest compliance <laughs> bid, the lowest bid being a local contractor. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Councillor. Just one question, Richard. Who's going to be monitoring this? Uh, I, I, I'm talking about the, the, the rock that's going to be leaving. Uh, we will have a third party watching that. So uh, we, we've uh, done a uh, contract with a, a project management company and we'll likely bring them into third party uh, oversee. Yeah. Other comments? Once again, great work. We're Thank solving you. all these big infrastructure problems one at a time, and we're getting it done. Thanks to the hard work of our staff, so we really appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, if there's no further discussion, all those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next uh, we have a letter of support for Trinity House. Uh, the recommendation is the Mayor and Council provide a letter of support to the Trinity House in support of their application to the Canadian Mental Health Association, British Columbia Division, for additional recovery beds. Moved by Councillor Renhawa, seconded by Councillor Skelton Morvan. Uh, just quickly say I met with the Trinity House uh, folks last week, um, and some new funding has been uh, initiated by the BC government uh, before they did their election. And uh, they're, um, it's looking like they might be able to qualify for this additional funding, which I think would be good for the program here. Uh, so uh, they said that uh, having a lot of support from us helps them with this application. So, you know, once again, just supporting the people in our community and, and Willie and his team uh, who have been doing a great job at Trinity House and lots of great, uh, great progress and uh, results that are happening from the program that they're running here in town. So just wanted to say that totally 100% support this. Any other comments? Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion's carried. Next, we have a report from our Manager of Transportation and Economic Development regarding the Community Economic Recovery Infrastructure Fund funding application for the CN building refurbishment. So I will be presenting this on behalf of uh, Mr. Venditelli this evening. So the reason for this report is that the provincial and federal funding uh, has been announced to support the efforts of municipalities towards community economic recovery in the light of COVID-19. Priority has been placed on shovel-ready projects that can be completed before a deadline of 2023. The CN Heritage Rail Station Revitalization Project fits within this unique heritage infrastructure steam stream of this funding, while also meeting many of the other broader objectives of funding by providing an improved tourist amenity, supporting job creation, and developing a new local destination. So there's a resolution before Council tonight that uh, requesting that Mayor and Council pass a resolution to support staff application for the grant funding through the ec Community Economic Recovery Infrastructure Program for up to $1 million to revitalize the CN Heritage Rail Station. Okay, moved by Councillor Cunningham, second by Councillor Nish. Discussion? I think this is, uh, we've already, I believe, made other applications to other funding agencies for this particular project, and I think at the previous council meeting, we also applied for, for additional funding for the actual waterfront project itself, too. So trying to get as much extra dollars in for this uh, waterfront development, I think, is a fantastic thing for the community. I think, uh, you know, if we can get additional funds on top of the funds that were announced back when we did the redesign launch event, 
Uh, I think the, that we're going to see a great new waterfront development. I just want to thank staff and also our partners at Kitkala who've been working closely with us to, uh, you know, make sure this project comes off the ground properly. And we're looking forward to seeing some more results on that in 2021. Okay. With that being said, any further comments, Councillor Ranawa? So just a quick question: Like, do we have to match any funding with that? Like, city has to match any? No, there's no uh, no funding matching needed. Okay. Okay. Oh, Councillor Eddy. Um, I, I don't know how clear we have how much clear information we have on the uses that the building will serve once this is all said and done. I guess I'm curious uh, I'm curious about that and it's probably premature to ask that question, but I am curious about it. I am also, um, wonder if there was a process of examining alternative um, targets for this kind of a funding application and if so, what they, what they were. Well, I could probably answer the first question, which I think is that right now, I believe there's still a design phase in, in plan for the waterfront, is that correct? There's still details that are being sorted out on where things are going and all that type of stuff, I believe. But so I couldn't tell you what the building use is going to be. But um, the second part of the question, I can't, I couldn't tell you where the staff was looking at that. But what I do know is that that waterfront will eventually, hopefully, generate some economic opportunities through tourism and things like that, as that'll be the new greeting for the town. As we know, we're moving the airport ferry down to that location. Kikala will have their own ferry down there in that location. So the idea is that we're going to generate. Uh, a new kind of sense of being in that waterfront. What it fully looks like yet, I think we're still having those details fully being mapped out right now. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Other questions? Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Thanks for being on top of the grant applications. I know that the uh, feds and the province both have a variety of different um, applications coming through. And I know we have another one coming up on our agenda. Okay, next we have the Prince Rupert Fire Rescue uh, regarding a proclamation request. Recommendation of the Council proclaims October 4th to 10th, 2020 as Fire Prevention Week as requested by the Prince Rupert Fire De Rescue Department. Moved by Councillor Scott Morvin, seconded by Councillor Randhawa. Any comments? Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Next, we have another request from the Rotary Club of Prince Rupert. Uh, recommendation that... Council proclaims Saturday, October 24th, 2020 as World Polio Day as requested by the Rotary Club of Prince Rupert. Moved by Councillor uh, Cunningham, second by Councillor Scott Morvin. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Okay, next we have another report from our Corporate Administrator regarding the BC Child Care Spaces Fund application. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through the recent completion of a child care needs assessment and action plan, the city identified a deficit in available child care, child care spaces in our community. That action plan also recommended a number of opportunities the city could take to increase the number of child care spaces in the community. Among those recommendation was to take advantage of the available BC child care spaces funding to support the renovation of a portion of the recreation complex to ac accommodate additional child care spaces. The request before Council this evening is that Mayor and Council pass a resolution to support staff applications for grant funding through the BC Child Care Spaces Fund to renovate and dedicate space upstairs at the recreation complex to lease to a child care operator and that the City of Prince Rupert commits to funding any cost overruns above and beyond the project funding. Um, with that, uh, just a note that the um, project is 100% funded, so any overages would, uh, would be minimal at most. Great. Okay, so uh, anyone want to pass that recommendation? Move that recommendation. Moved by Councillor Nish, second by Councillor Skelton Morvin. I'll just say I think this is 100% needed in this community. I think one of the challenges we've been hearing, and we heard it through the OCP as well, is childcare in this community needs to be increased. I mean, we've had folks who have been trying to have them, uh, new workers move here. They can't find childcare. People aren't taking jobs because of childcare. So for us to support this in any way we can, I think that's definitely beneficial to us. I like the process, and hopefully we can find other partners who want to work with us. But it's really time to get moving on childcare in this community, and uh, you know we'll hold the funds, and hopefully we can get an expression of interest, as the resolution says, and and find a way to get some new childcare spaces built in Rupert. I just noticed an announcement where funding was handed out to different uh, municipalities and villages 
for child care and Rupert was left out even after we'd identified the fact that we need child care in this town and we found out today how it's inhibiting some people moving to town because they can't mm -hmm. find child care for their kids and especially if you're a single parent and uh, you're a professional and you want to take a job in Prince Rupert and there's no child care available it's going to inhibit us attracting professional people to this town. Uh, why were we left off the list is my question. It's uh, Couldn't tell you. You know, like, uh, I, I think we should be lobbying a little more or asking people why we didn't get the funding. It's, uh, you know, we more than a lot of other communities needed as much or more. Well, we're doing our part right now in this very moment. So we finished the assessment, which I know we got funding for, and now we're going to get this application going to. I mean, the city's responsibility isn't child care. We're just applying for someone else on their behalf. Um, and obviously another conversation for MLA as well, as it's more of a provincial responsibility. But we're going to partner the best we can to, to just get it done like we do. Any other comments? I have a question, Mr. Mayor. Uh, sure, we'll do. Uh, we'll go ahead first, and then we'll do Council Ready after. Um, I, I just noticed in the report uh, the current deficit of 49 child care spaces, but one number, how many child care spaces do you think this renovation could open up? Um, that uh, would need to be determined based on who applied to run the facility. So we'll do the renovation and then someone else would run it. So it depends on what their licensing would be able to do and what they can accommodate comfortably. Okay, maybe I'll ask that question a different way then. What's the rough square footage? That's a great question. I will need to consult with the uh, Recreation Department, uh, Maintenance Department, to confirm that information, and I can get back to you. Sounds good. Thanks. Councillor Eddy? Yeah, I, I will say I, I heard the same report that Councillor Cunningham was referring to, and it... it uh, it, it, it certainly kind of stood out given our, our current needs. And having said that, I, I concur that uh, um, a, as we stand and as we look at this proposal, this is uh, something we need to move forward on. And if it uh, gets us closer to the destination of solving the, solving the problems we have, then uh, I think it'll be a positive thing. Okay, any further comments? Okay, all those in favor? Many opposed? This motion's carried. Next, we have a report from our Director of Operations, although I don't know if you have to add anything else to this, but uh, it's the uh, Edward and Albert Ave Road closure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the only thing to add is just that uh, we haven't had any official comments. We've had someone uh, view the documents, uh, but no official comments have come forward through the uh, process, and we've augmented the drawing as per Council's request to ma ensure that all uh, current accesses are maintained for for those properties so we're just looking for a uh, second and third reading and then to go to Ministry of Transportation approval for the bylaw then it will come back for final Great. thank you sounds good moving it or question yeah, yeah, move it okay so move the recommendation second by Councilor Nish go ahead okay, uh, it says in the uh, first uh, part of the bylaw that uh, that uh, which is shown outlined in bold black on the reference plan. And when you go to the reference plan, it shows it going right to Alexander, which blocks off those houses we discussed that have access right now. I'm quite sure it was an oversight, but... Uh, uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, no, we, we've actually brought it in um, on Alexandra... Um, to lot uh, eight, so that the the Eleventh Avenue properties and down on the lower one, the, uh, the the last property, which it goes to forty eight, so it's brought back, so that twenty and twenty one lots um, can re remain with their access as well. Yeah. I'm just pointing out the diagram we've got oh. has the bold lines going right to Alexander, which uh, if we pass this as it sits. Oh, um, I can give you an updated map. We've had all that corrected for, okay. for the current bylaw. I apologize that that hasn't made it into your package. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, any other comments? Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have a report from our Chief Financial Officer regarding the 2025 Year Financial Plan Amendment Bylaw Number 3457-2020. Under the community charter, a municipality must adopt a five-year financial plan annually. A financial plan may also be amended by bylaw at any time. The report provided to Council outlines the items included in the attached financial plan amendment bylaw. At the July 20th meeting, Council approved a contract to remove the remaining two above-ground tanks in the Moresby area. Adding this project to the original tank removal results in allocating the approved use of surplus of 100000 an adjustment to the accrual balance of 91000 and the use of $816,000 from the Northern Capital and Planning Grant Reserve. City staff have worked to secure a new location suitable for the replacement RCMP building mandated by the federal government. The arrangement sees the land and building owned by the Jehovah's Witnesses on the corner of McBride and 3rd Avenue East acquired for this purpose. The Jehovah's Witnesses congregation will purchase city land as previously advertised at the corner of McBride and 9th Avenue West. The budget amendment necessary to proceed with this project is $2 million, which includes land acquisition and legal costs, engineering and geotechnical costs, and architectural design costs. Funding of this part of the project is from land sale proceeds of $225,000 and $1.775 million from the Northern Capital and Planning Grant Reserve. The final amendment affects fiscal revenue and reserves. The city received part of the grant awarded last year for the water treatment and submarine line project, also known as phase three of our water project, and an additional northern capital and planning grant after the five-year financial plan was adopted. These funds need to be transferred to their respective reserves. There is no impact to taxation resulting from any of these amendments. Notice of the proposed amendment to the five-year financial plan was posted on the City Hall Notice Board as well as placed on the website. The public was asked to submit comments and as of end of today, there were none received. Council is asked to introduce and give first, second and third reading to the 2020 five-year financial plan amendment bylaw number 3457-2020. Thank you. Okay, and you want to move that? Move by Councilor Renhala, second by Councilor Aidy. Comments from Council? Councilor Nish. I just want to highlight the part where you talk about the RCMP building and, and the fact that we finally managed to deal with this and, and uh, good work by staff uh, finally coming to a resolution and, and a, a solution to replace this building. I mean, as much as we all would prefer not to have to pay for it, it's, uh, it's inevitable that we have to and, uh, and, and, and the federal government is going to make sure of that. So good job in, in finally securing a, a, what I feel is a, probably a spectacular location for a police station. So, good job. Councilor Aidy. I, I have know. a question, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, we'll go Councilor Aidy, then you, Councilor Moreau. I think Councilor Moreau and I are on the same clock. Um, <laughs> uh, my question is about the old RCMP location and do we is it premature to ask what what we might see happening there yes at the moment it is we don't know what we're going to do with that particular building um, however all four of those corner corners are covenanted to be public use Councilor Morrow. uh thanks very much mr mayor I, I think it's it's good that we all kind of thought that this budget amendment would just be COVID uh, revenue declining type of amendments, but it's good to have some good news in there as well. Um, and it, based on that August variance, it's also really encouraging to hear that we're still on a path to balance by fiscal year end. Um, I'm just left with one question around the um, general operating fund, around the forecast for uh, user fee revenues. I think you, you identified kind of the main ones that have all experienced a, a bit of a hit um, by the pandemic, but the one in particular uh, that I'm looking at is the arena because I've seen you've you've adjusted uh, the anticipated revenues across all the other you know airport, marina, civic center, pool, and transit anywhere from 50 to 150 thousand dollars for this year, but the arena um, has stayed the same in terms of forecasted user fees. I'm just wondering if you can 
provide us a little context to that. Well, we do actually have, a, we're looking for a, uh, an ice maker. So we've got lowered cost on that, even though we're probably, we're having lowered arena revenue um, in the short term because we just put the ice in and it just opened basically in October. So we're short by one month there. So we've got, um, we weren't incurring costs for ice makers in September. So that offsets some of the lost revenues as well. Again, it is, uh, it's not significant enough to be making any amendments to the financial plan for that particular department. Um, at the end of the day, our forecast is still that it's going to come out to a balance. Excellent. Thanks so much. Other comments? Well, I'll just also add that I think it's been 15 years since the RCMP station has been a issue for the community potentially even longer uh, and I just want to congratulate the team for brokering this arrangement and 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 driving down costs and doing their best to be innovative and also tying this into downtown revitalization as well I mean this won't be completed until we pass final reading which will be at the end of I'm guessing our October meeting uh, but the fact is that you know I'm all in favor of this I mean we I've been on calls with other mayors across the north and other regions in BC and I can tell you right now that this community is standing in a very good position financially compared to many other communities who are slashing and cutting their budgets and laying people off and and losing revenue left right and center and you know we are holding the line the best we can uh, with the and I, I, I test that to the staff and their innovation and the way they go about cost saving measures and, and making sure that we're getting things done. So uh, I think this is good news for the community and I'm looking forward to seeing uh, more construction happening in our downtown through this new building in the future. So thanks again for your hard work and any other further comments? Mr. Manager. Huh. <coughs> is, is, the ca is the camera on? Uh, <laughs> Dr. Manager. Um, I, <laughs> I, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, Corinne, uh, CFO, for uh, certainly the RCMP building. That's been something that she has been focused on uh, doggedly for uh, probably ever since I arrived. Uh, something that uh, she's uh, done a great job on and was very complicated and very difficult to get to. But she's got there and I, I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, in front of council and in front of the community. That is a super uh, great job and difficult uh, challenge, certainly, both financially, locationally, and in terms of trying to find the right, the right spot. And I think she's done a brilliant job. So just wanted to say that. Speech? That's no, good. Uh, any further comments? <laughs> okay. No further comments. All in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Looking forward to finishing that off at the end of October. Okay. And speaking of that, we have another report from our Chief Financial Officer. Do you have anything at, to add to this? So the recommendation that Council give fourth and final reading to the Woodworth Dam or Temporary Replacement Borrowing Bylaw Number 3458-2020. And that council give fourth and final reading to the solid waste infrastructure temporary borrowing bar bylaw number three four five nine twenty twenty. Moved by Councillor Scott Morvin, second by Councillor Cunningham. Discussion. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carried. Okay, we have a notice of motion from last meeting. Uh, Councillor Cunningham, or er, Niche. <laughs> well, I I mean I I brought this up because I I feel that. Um, until we have a, with the enforcement of uh, these containers in in our light industrial area, I, I, I felt that, you know, we have to finish the work before I think we should engage in enforcing uh, a, you know, a, a bylaw that's really not ready, uh, or you know, an or an outdated one, I guess you can say. So what I'm, I guess, requesting is that. Not necessarily that we have to cease bylaw enforcement at this moment, but that maybe we can kind of just move forward by uh, getting a staff report on the work that we had done in the previous bylaw, or that we, we started working on it, we were going to do it, um, and it hasn't got that far. So what I would like to see is I would like to see 
before any more enforcement is done, I would like to see a report on where we got to that and if we could see that report or set it up so that we could finish those bylaws in our new OCP and, and continue on with a good um, enforceable bylaw in, I guess, November or so. Um, so I don't know if we have to go through the whole, uh, you know, motion right now. If I can, is it possible that I can just request for a report first before we actually further go any further? Is that, does that work with staff or? Sure, that, uh, that would be fine. I mean, it's probably best to have a resolution of council to have the staff present a report. Okay. And, uh, and then we can work on that and have it back probably in time for the November bylaw. Then I am putting forward a motion to, uh, to ask for a report and the information that we've already worked on on this bylaw as far as uh, containers and light industrial so that we can continue in November. Okay, moved by Councillor Nish, second by Councillor Cunningham. You talking? Uh, no, I, I, I totally agree with Councillor Nish. Uh, we've got to clarify this. Uh, if you look at M1 zoning, it, uh, it says accessory buildings and structures. So uh, that to me says containers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this has to be clarified and done properly. And if it means rezoning some of M1 to another category, then so be it. But it's something we have to look at because, uh, you know, just about every industrial site you go by now from here to Vancouver has containers in it. And uh, they're becoming more and more the norm. So we've got to modernize our bylaws to get with what's happening. You know, like if it's, uh, if they're kept neat and tidy and maintained, fine. If they're not, then we go after the person that's not following the new bylaw, if there is a new bylaw. It's uh, why punish everyone for the action of one, is my attitude. Councillor Scott Marvin. Yeah, thank, thankfully we're, we're in the process of an OCP update, so a lot of these bylaws and some of these challenges are being uh, addressed. So, the, so I, I think that we're already in motion for a lot of these things and getting these problems addressed. and. Uh, we can probably rest assured that they'll be tackled in that particular process. Other comments? Okay, I think just a procedural yeah. question, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Um, is is the wording of the motion, sorry, to ask for a report from staff, or is it to stop enforcement until that report is complete? It's just to uh, ask us, uh, a report from staff. So we're amending what uh, the notice of motion was and putting it, uh, replacing it with a new worded motion related to the topic. Okay, yeah. If it's, ju if it's just a report, then then that's fine. I think, and sorry, Councillor Cunningham's mic cut out, so I apologize if I'm just repeating what he said, but um, as part of this wider OCP and, and zoning bylaw update, I, I think it's, uh, there's no sense in us trying to avoid the issue of containers any longer. It's, uh, I think we need to come to embrace the container as it's kind of, quickly becoming the lifeblood of the community. So I, I think we have no choice but to consider it in, as we try to regulate form and function. So I think that the report would actually be timely in how we can include uh, containers into our into our zoning bylaw. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so, any further discussion? Well, yeah, just to clarify, I, I guess I did say that basically enforcement would not be there w until the staff report has kind of come forward and we can kind of deal with it. So it, it is, it is, it is kind of the same motion, but I'm asking for this report so that we can kind of get this bylaw back onto the uh, books to discuss it. So I, I guess it is, how did you write it? So we can hear it now. Well, yeah, and that, that is the nature of my procedural question. Cause I, I'm absolutely yeah. in favor of the report, but I would not be in favor of temporarily suspending yeah, enforcement of a bylaw because that opens a ton of can of worms. And I think everyone knows over the last few years, I'm process to me is equally as important as, as product. And while I agree with Councillor Nish on the product, which is that we should be trying to find creative and innovative ways to get containers uh, in industrial zones, I, I wouldn't be in favor of opening that can of worms of temporarily overriding our own bylaw. Yeah. So
So how I have the uh, resolution notice is that staff would provide a report on the status of the amendment of the zoning bylaw number 3286-2009 and the use of shipping containers within an M1 area. I did not understand that you wish to suspend the enforcement of the bylaw. Okay, well, <laughs> seeing where this is kind of going, uh, I guess I can all accept that uh, that the way it's written there. Um, I, I would just hope that maybe we can have an understanding. Well, I'll just add that our OCP and the bylaws are all coming forward shortly to council within the next two months. And I think, uh, yes, we had done some workshops in the past. Uh, I remember when LNG was here, we were doing a variety of things on on these types of initiatives and the, the all the bylaws in this community are going to get updated to current st to a current level and uh, you know I think nothing's going to be able to get through and, until we pass it all so I think this will be able to sort out fairly quickly and we can get some information from staff but I think it all by the by this end of this year we'll have this all sorted out for sure well you know, I, I agree, but I, I also think that uh, the zoning allows them. So I, I don't know where this bylaw that says they have to be moved because M1 is, de you know, accessory buildings and structures. So, you know, where, you know, it, you know, they are an, an accessory building or a structure, you know, like it's... I believe it's the definition of what that, a, 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 a container is not disclassified as an accessory building. And that's where we need to, as a policy level, make some changes so that it makes sense that in a light industrial zone, people can obviously have containers as long as they're kept clean and they're kept, you know, uniform and they're, they look good and type of thing. But currently, the bylaw doesn't state it like that. So that's where this update needs to come so that it makes sense for users. So it's, I would say, a small, uh, you know, past issue like we're, we've been dealing with that we just need to update and get correct so that it makes sense for business owners in town to be able to use containers on their property in those in those zones. So what we're asking is everyone to move their containers and then when we pass a new bylaw they can bring them back? Is that what you're... That's not what we're saying to people. They need to make them into compliance and our corporate administrator has already spoke with all the owners on the in the area and everyone's uh, making some small uh, adjustments to the situation but it, it doesn't it's not going to be a big upheaval. It's just that we need to get some better wording on so that we can move forward as a community and this in this uh, and it will be done here shortly so is that about right yeah okay all those in favor any opposed motion carried okay so I thought I'd give a quick report tonight um, so you know as we just finished the OCP process with the community and we had some government meetings and I'm sure Councillor 80 wants to give an update as well on the UBCM and stuff so um, I thought I'd just get started. Um, so we set up plan in motion as a community uh, back in 2015. We started with the Hayes 2.0 vision uh, and at that time you know Watson Island was still fully the mill was still on the site and we didn't have the water project moving forward or any other infrastructure moving forward. Financially, we were, I remember one of our first budgets was arguing over $30,000 uh, issues in an enhancement grant and we just didn't have the, the room to move. And since that time, we decided that we were gonna stick to some priorities and get some things done. And now we're at a p place about six years later where we've accomplished, accomplished a lot as a community, you know, we've, we tore down the old mill, we got those chemicals off the site, we got a proponent on there now that's going to be operating here, I believe, in 2021, they're set for operation, uh, and, and, and Watson Island is going fantastically well for this community, and revenue starting to come in for, uh, for the community from that. Uh, you know, in 2015, we got the first grant for the water supply, and the water supply situation has been our number one priority as a community since I mean, before even before we were on council, but uh, the, our council was the one that got out and got the grants moving. And phase one is now completed that water supply project. Phase two, which is the dam replacement, it will be completed in sometime in 2021. Uh, currently, we are pumping water from Shawatlands Lake to the community. Uh, and we've been pumping water since we disconnected the community from the primary water supply at, at Woodworth. I believe it was back in 2016 is when we started that process. 
And the challenge is that Shawatlands is more prone to turbidity compared to Woodworth Lake. Uh, and, and every time we have these intense rainfalls, uh, turbidity gets into the water and we can't uh, get it out without, uh, without just naturally flushing it out of the system. And so once we are able to finish phase two, which is to reconnect to Woodworth, we will reconnect the community to the main water supply uh, and we will be back on the Woodworth primary water supply which may see uh, alleviation of these turbidity notices that we've been seeing in the community. And I just wanted to make sure that was clear to the community that, because I've heard comments that, you know, why all of a sudden are we having these problems? Uh, and it's not necessarily that the water condition is in poor condition, it's just that we are not usual, on our usual water supply. It is our backup supply, but it has been our primary supply for the last couple of years while we replace the water lines and while we are replacing the dam. And it's anticipated that once we reconnect in 2021 to the main water supply, we should hopefully see the less turbidity issue. The final frontier, which I believe is the treatments uh, uh, phase three, the treatment um, facility, as well as the submarine line replacements that go from the mainland to the island, uh, that is currently in engineering. I don't have an ETA yet on that project, but we should have an update for the community by the end of the year or early 2021 on the status of the treatment facility. And that is going to treat the issues around the pH, and that will treat the issues that we were discussing about the uh, people having the lead or, or copper in their home piping system. And that will neutralize the water and, and can't say 100% for certain, but it will hopefully 99.9% uh, .9 uh, end that leaching effect uh, from old pipes uh, in people's homes or businesses. Uh, but we are still advising people at this time to continue with the flushing program. If you don't know if you have lead in your home pipes uh, and to continue with that process at this time. And But when the treatment facility is up and running, uh, that should alleviate uh, that issue. But however, you are advised to replace your home infrastructure piping or your business's piping, regardless if the treatment facility comes online or, or it doesn't. So I just wanted to provide some clarity that that project, we are in the middle of phase two, um, and we're looking forward to having that project come to full completion here in the next couple of years, and that will give us a brand new state-of-the-art water system for uh, you know the next 100 plus years. Uh, so we've been able to accomplish that. Now tonight you heard that we're moving forward with the RCMP station. Uh, we've, over the last two years, council has budgeted in both our budgets uh, money away for the for paying for the RCMP station. And so we've been already been allocating the funds for the payment of the RCMP station, which won't be coming out of your any new taxation for that. And now we know where the location is going to be. And once again, we already did the accolades for our CFO, but, you know, it's one of those tough uh, Pros projects that requires federal provincial intersection and we have finally got an agreeable location and agreeable partners and we're able to do a land exchange and I think that's a great uh, thing for the community so another 15 year old issue that we're now coming and solving uh, and then now with the landfill right we just heard tonight we are we're moving forward with the expansion of the landfill uh, we have some other ideas around, uh, you know, waste diversion, things like that. Operations is working on a full-scale plan around that. Uh, I know that we're still looking towards the uh, home recycle pickup. That type of thing is still in motion. Uh, so, you know, solving another big infrastructure problem like that. And through this OCP, you know, we've been hearing from community members and community groups on, you know, our future plans, which we just finished this, you know, uh, large process with port communities or port companies and and we did the redesign process and now the OCP is to translate that into reality and the way I like my analogy would be is that as a council we've been focusing on building a new foundation to a house and the public though is not necessarily seeing uh, you know nice painted walls and new couches and, and new foliage because we've been fixing these cracks in our infrastructure and we know that our infrastructure deficit is about $350 million. And to fix that, we've had to fix our revenue challenges, which is through Watson Island and through uh, new industrial development happening in this community. And we've been funneling the, that rural resources into fixing that infrastructure and fixing that foundation. But we also know that there's a huge desire to see the, this community have, uh, you know, the walls start getting painted and new couches start coming in and new windows are being put into that house. And so the visual elements that the community needs to see. And those things are new downtown development, new waterfront developments, and new housing developments on top of new trails and parks and all those nice things that we know the community is looking for. And 
now that we're kind of getting to this point where we're catching up with the infrastructure delay, we're able to focus our attentions more on, on those things. So the RCMP, for example, station is the beginning of a nicer downtown development area within that core that we're going to start to focus our attentions on. We got both waterfront developments moving forward. We've applied for additional grants for the main waterfront uh, down at Quinitza, as well as we know the PRPA is still moving forward with their CO Cove development, and the community can look forward to two new waterfront developments uh, potentially in 2021. We'll start seeing uh, some construction going uh, in those areas. Uh, I also know on the housing front that there are a variety of housing projects, unfortunately unannounced yet, that are coming to Prince Rupert or are here now. Uh, and I'm hoping that we can get a report out to the community on how many units that's going to be by uh, sometime this fall because we are at a very um, low vacancy rate in this community and we need more housing. But after, you know, I spent the last week, you know, analyzing all the projects and speaking with different folks that have different pr proposals here. And I'm very confident that we're going to start to speed up the housing process and get many more units online for this community for the long term because I know it's one of the biggest challenges that we're facing, not just us, but every community I've talked to, every single mayor, every single community in BC across Canada is having a housing challenge right now. But, you know, we're just going to get her done. And on top of the housing challenge, we have the child care challenge. So child care and housing is number one for us to be able to recruit people to the community as well as be able to sustain the existing population here. And for us to grow, those two things need to grow in conjunction and we have a strategy that's moving forward uh, for that. Uh, we're also moving forward and staff have, are creating a plan right now on a downtown cleanup initiative, starting to work with our bylaw enforcement to get the downtown cleaned up. And as you, mem you probably are aware from the August council meeting, council set an intention document to create new incentives for the downtown development. And we have a development, uh, we're hosting a, a, an event here in October for developers uh, from who are to come to Prince Rupert to take a look at the community. Uh, we're gonna do it with all COVID protocols in place, of course, and, and, and spark that interest for folks to come and start building some new housing, downtown development. And you know we set that intention document to do 10 year tax breaks uh, and also five year tax breaks on existing buildings. So council already is aware of that. And at the end of this year, we'll have a bylaw that puts that into motion. So that is going to spark, you know, on top of the cleaning up part, we also have the carrot and the stick model, right? Where you, we have buildings that need to get cleaned up, but we also need to give something for people to want to renovate their buildings, want to develop new commercial spaces. And so I'm very confident that these programs that we're going to be putting in, as well as the completion of the, of the OCP by the end of this year, is going to start the process of really kickstarting Prince Rupert Ford. And as we tackle these infrastructure problems more and more each year, as those things are getting funded and, and those replacements are happening, over time, over the next decade, that's why it's the 2030 plan, we're going to start to be able to redirect city resources into the more visual elements of the community. So my explanation to folks that were doing the OCP was to let them know that, you know, that is our strategy, right? We had a, a, a catch-up part piece with the infrastructure, and now it's time to move into the development of the community itself develop more parks, develop more trails, develop the downtown, develop the waterfronts. So I just wanted folks to know that after our OCP process, meeting with a variety of different groups, you know, I've, I've never seen this level of support for a plan. And there was wording changes that certain groups had to say, but nothing in terms of the meat or structure of the actual plan. Everyone really liked the idea of us trying to fit that much housing in the downtown. They liked the idea of the midtown, the new downtown, and the uh, marina district. Uh, so there wasn't too much issues with that. Uh, but moving forward, once that's complete, 2021, we're going to see, I believe, a new development environment in Prince Rupert. Those incentives will be clear. There'll be a new development process for developers that want to come and develop in the downtown core, incentivizing housing development, incentivizing new commercial spaces, and condensing that downtown core into the new downtown plan. I, I'm, I'm the most excited I've been for this community in a really long time. Uh, and, and we've been able to do all of this stuff without actually increasing anyone's taxes. So, I mean, that's a testament to the type of innovation that we've been bringing to the table. So all of these infrastructure pieces are, are not additionally, ad, ad, in fact, we lowered taxes last year. And here we are with a new financial plan, or the, the amendment of the fi five-year financial plan with no tax increases to the community either, which I remember Councillor Aidy was saying uh, at the, in April, well, you know, what, we'll have to see how this goes. Well, here we are. So 
it, you know, it's no easy feat to be able to try to accomplish this amount of pr these projects on the ground, the amount of initiatives that the staff are working on with the capacity that they have, managing once and I imagining these big major projects uh, and, and, and we're doing it all uh, without having to increase taxes. And I just have to say that's a testament to council's will to stay, stick to the priorities. You know, we created a timeline on infrastructure and we're literally hitting those timelines and working our, our buns off to get the grants and things that we need to get and working with the province and working with the feds. We had great meetings with the province and then of course an election was called. So we're just gonna have to wait and see. But we've also, staff have created great relationships with uh, staff within the province and staff within the federal government. So now we have a team between the federal government and the provincial government who know Prince Rupert's growing, who know the challenges that we have, and they're working with us to develop a, a whole variety of strategies to ensure that Prince Rupert's community can grow in a way that not only supports the, the port growth, but supports the community at a social and economic level as well. So I'm just uh, very excited and I wanted to you know, do a bit of a report on an update of where we're at. And so our, the next couple months is to finish the OCP, get all of our bylaws updated, uh, and then we're going to send letters out to folks who are in the downtown, letting them know of our new incentives. But we're also going to be sending letters out saying, by the way, if you have a property that's derelict, it's time for you to start cleaning up, and we're going to start moving forward with getting this town spruced up. And I think people have been telling us all over, and I think we're prepared to get moving on that too. And I think it's time for us, and we're going to set a three-year timeline on those incentives. So that's the time for us to really blitz this town and get some things moving. So we'll have some more information uh, near the end of the fall, uh, particularly around the housing piece. And uh, but I'm I'm excited to say that you know we've been able to accomplish a lot here as a council, and with staff's hard work. And uh, and that's my report, <laughs> Councilor Gunnan. With that all said, I'd like to acknowledge the fact that we can sit here and talk about what we're going to do in that, but it's the staff that has to do it, and uh, the staff doesn't get the recognition sometimes. We're uh, asking them to take care of the present, look out for the future, and look over their shoulder at what's going on at the same time. And, uh, you know, I know a few times I bow breed them in that, but at the same time, I, go, I, I take my hat off to the work they've got done. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're doing multiple tasks sometimes and that. And, uh, you know, everything you just spoke about, the staff's involved in it one way or another. So, uh, you know, I take my hat off to them. We've got great staff. But, uh, you know, I, I just think that uh, they don't get the acknowledgement. Sometimes they should. Councillor Adey, then Councillor Scumbo. And I would also say that your, your reference to what I said in April was, was a reference to our exp early experience of a pandemic. And I, I've heard the analogy drawn that, that responding to an, um, an organization responding to the pandemic is a bit like trying to build the airplane while it's in the air. Um, and I, I think, you know, the, I, I echo Councillor Council Cunningham's thoughts that the staff has just been stellar. In a in a very unpredictable time, and so I you know I, I think we're in as good a place as we could possibly and reasonably ex have expected to be, uh, given those circumstances, and they should get the credit for it. Yeah, I'd like to echo a lot of those thoughts as well, and uh, add to some of the Councillor Cunningham's statements about uh, managing multiple tasks at times. I would say that they're managing tasks all the time, simultaneously, <laughs> multiple. Th uh, for a municipality our size, we have so much going on between the telecommunications company, we're in the port export business, and a lot of folks uh, don't really realize that a lot of how much of a uh, different variety of uh, matters that we manage all simultaneously, but also that the staff are, handle those day-to-day -day matters. So I think that, you know, for us, I'm biased, but I think we have the best staff in the country, and we are kind of changing the game and paving the way for other municipalities and how they can kind of deviate a little bit less away from the property tax model, which is clearly broken, and then kind of move towards kind of an enterprising kind of uh, providing of uh, different services and, and outsourcing different revenues. <laughs> thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, so everybody already said, so thanks for great work. So I have one question, like uh, with COVID, uh, Air Canada, they got some flights from like, and now they are still not doing, I think, seven days. So I was wondering if we can ask them to at least seven days they can do here. 
so because in winter it's hard to go terrace for people so I, I was wondering you have any idea on that I'm sorry councillor Randau I missed the very first part like uh, in cover like a uh, cover time like Air Canada they cut some flights here right so three days now four days I think so I was wondering like people are asking if they at least can do seven days here so people don't have to drive to terrace so uh, they they did actually increase it up to seven that they had told the airport authority and then they rolled that back within a week so we can ask but we're not gonna it's not gonna drive what Air Canada does so the airport authority I know has been very very receptive to want to have seven days and then of course get back to two flights a day because um, that will help their organization but at presently it's it, Air Canada is the one that's driving this. Councilor Rainey, do you want to do your report? Yeah, I, I, I do. Um, I participated in uh, a number of the uh, forums that existed in terms of this year's version of the UBCM and I promised my fellow councillors that I would limit my remarks to about 90 minutes, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I'm going to shorten it up a lot because I can't match the mayor's enthusiasm level. Um, but I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll give it a shot. Um, obviously, it was very different from previous conventions. L last year, we all went down to Vancouver and uh, were treated to uh, uh, perhaps a an appropriate uh, way of saying it, the full meal deal. Um, and this year's version was entirely online. Um, and there was a, there's definitely obviously a trade-off there. I think the trade-off is this, that the online version um, means, uh, I think, probably a very significant cost savings to taxpayers. Um, I think it was just a matter of the registration fee for me. Um, and the advantage is that since I'm sitting on my couch at home, if I think that a uh, session is not relevant to me, I don't have to watch it and I don't have to feel guilty about that. Um, and I get to carry on my normal life uh, and support my family and still attend the convention. So it, it's got some advantages. Uh, there were some technical glitches, uh, particularly I think during the resolutions debates um, and it required a little bit of uh, wizardry to, to get around that. The in-person convention, of course, has the advantage of networking. There's a lot of networking between different communities, different councils, and with different levels of government, face-to-face -face meetings with government. Um, and I thought the, the in-person the in version, the, the discussion of the resolutions themselves is probably fuller and doesn't have those glitches. Um, and then in the middle of all that, uh, the provincial government called an election. And what that meant for the organizers was that they had to literally change the program overnight because some of the speakers could no longer speak in the capacities that they would normally have had because the, the writ had been dropped. And, and I'd, I'd like to commend the, uh, the organizers for their agility in that regard. They did, they did a good job. All three leaders, in fact, did speak at the convention, but I think that the tone and the... Um, purpose of those speeches is probably different than it would have been um, without without the election call. Uh, two highlights for me. Uh, one was Margaret Atwood, and this is be you know partly because she's a pretty interesting person, partly because I'm an old English teacher, um, gave her thoughts on leadership and climate change and the pandemic. And if anybody wants to ask me, she also gave me a reading list of uh, books on the environment, which I intend to spend some time with. Um, um, she did have some, uh, some advice for municipal leaders and m left me wondering what kind of a mayor she would have made. Um, probably not quite like Ms. Mayor Brain. However, she did make the following point, which I think, I think that the mayor will, uh, will agree to since he's just said it, um, that it's important in community building to find projects that you can get a general consensus and that people can buy into on a broad scale uh, and what we're being told is that some of what's in the future for Prince Rupert has that has that quality so that's a good thing um, and the other highlight for me was a, a panel discussion on 
whatever the new now is after COVID, after we get through all of this stuff, what's changed? And the, the panel participants included an economic, uh, economist, an urban planner, expert on transportation and climate change, technical proponents. And the takeaway for me was the fact that so many people have gone to work from home and we've learned how to do that. And I know that's happened to a degree even on city staff. Uh, it certainly happened in our household in terms of the school system. Um, and the idea being that that's not necessarily going all the way back. We're not going back all the way to normal. So you're going to see a lot more people working from home. And what that means for communities is that you don't have to live in Vancouver to work in Vancouver. And so then you're going to have people that are going to make choices, lifestyle choices, to live in other communities, po potentially smaller communities, with more of an outdoor life, more outdoor amenities. And that's where building the community, as we're trying to do here, um, becomes really significant because you have to build a community that people who can work from home would choose in terms of where they would choose to live. Um, and it becomes part of the challenge. And if you do it right, I think it, it's an opportunity to really create so, uh, you know, some really good diversity through making it livable, making it walkable, uh, recreational opportunities, and so on. So that was an important takeaway for me. Um, and so my last word on it is that it was a pretty interesting experience. And we'll see where we are next year. Um, and I suppose I would like to see that there be some kind of a marriage between the way it was done this year and take the best of the way it was done this year and take the best of what you can do in an in-person convention um, and, and put those together and see if we can't have a, uh, an even better model going forward. Great. Thank you for that report. Other reports from Council? Yeah. Councillor Scott Morgan? Yeah, I'd just like to add what Cou Councillor Adian mentioned, uh, just that the, no, I think a marriage between the two probably would be ideal, especially with the circumstances. Uh, having, having been the the, the only counselor along with Dr. Long to go and attend uh, the, the FCM convention um, and you know that experience that came with that I think that uh, a lot of uh, local government is, is is building those relationships with with uh, not only cabinet but also the procurement process so a lot of these items are are things that kind of are still making making way in the foreground and kind of the background but I, the matter of the just actually building those relationships requires showing up. So whether that's, and I've been adjusting to the Zoom life and all that kind of stuff with all of the pandemic, but actually showing up in person and making those connections. And a lot of them are by chance encounter, but just by showing up and actually making yourself available and finding off those those items that can kind of address some of the bigger challenges that we're facing in the community. But I'm, you know, a marriage between the two, I'm, I'm definitely in favor of. So, and I'd like to thank Councillor Aidy for the report. Any other reports from Council? Okay, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn and uh, reconvene our recessed uh, closed council meeting under section 90.1 C and E of the community charter. Moved by Councillor Renhala, second by Councillor Aidy. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Thank you.